Uh, good morning. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I have the task of discussing my preferred treatment for Les Frank injuries, which is open reduction internal fixation without fusion. Uh, Cliff Jones is, of course, going to give the, the counter to that uh, regarding the fusion. I'll just go through what is clearly a very sophisticated audience, uh, get right down to the meat and potatoes. And it's really, why do we need to have this discussion? Well, I think Rod Quo, uh, back in 2000, uh, identified or was... Hmm, presumed to have identified a subgroup that seemed to do poorly with these particular injuries. And this subgroup was the purely ligamentous uh, Lisfranc frank injury. And as you go through uh, Quo's article, which is an outcome study on Lisfranc frank fractures and the operative treatment, the open reduction and fixation of this treatment, there are several things that I learned. And one of the things I learned was that an anatomic reduction matters, and this has been borne out by other authors. I learned that purely ligamentous Lisfranc frank injuries actually had no statistically greater incidence of degenerative changes than combined osseous ligamentous uh, injuries, that there was no difference in their MFA or ankle foot scores compared with combined osseous ligamentous injuries, and that two screws across the first TMT added rotational stability, prevented plantar gapping, and decreased screw breakage rate, and that was with screws that were 3.5 millimeters in diameter. What else did I learn? I learned that the word trend and the phrase purely ligamentous occurred together in the same sentence six times throughout the manuscript. Well, this certainly was fuel for discussion, and uh, that leads to speculation. And we speculate, obviously, that ligamentous healing is unpredictable compared to osseous healing, that it's clearly not strong enough, and that subsequent joint degeneration occurs because the tarsal metatarsal joint remains unstable. And if we follow them all long enough, all the ligamentous ones will become rife with arthritis, collapse, deform, and then they'll have to have fusions and they have all that broken hardware in there too. And I think speculation is very good because it makes us want to study something, and that is primary arthrodesis of this particular injury at this particular joint for the treatment of these purely ligamentous disruptions. Lee, in 2006, produced this article, The Treatment of Primarily Ligamentous Lisfranc frank Joint Injuries, where there's a randomized comparison of primary arthrodesis compared with open reduction and internal fixation. And what was clearly demonstrated in this particular study was that there were significantly better ankle foot scores and a return to activity in primary arthrodesis group than in the open reduction and internal fixation group. And not only that, when we look at their open reduction and internal fixation group, we find that 25% of the ORIF group needed later fusions, that 75% of the ORIFs needed their screws removed, which is substantially higher than that seen in the primary arthrodesis group. And if we look a little bit closer, we identify that weight bearing is initiated at six weeks in both groups. The other thing that we learned is that those people that had late fusions definitely improved, but they didn't improve to a level that the primary arthrodesis group achieved. And I think this is kind of borne out again a little bit in the clavicle literature that we're seeing now about clavicle non-unions and malunions taken down and seeing how their functional results, results uh, uh, end up compared to those that are treated acutely, which is an interesting corollary. So what did I learn from Lee's article? I learned that ORIF doesn't have a fighting chance with those kinds of numbers. Cliff Jones is on this paper, which I think is an excellent paper that comes out in 2009 on open reduction and fixation versus primary arthrodesis for less frank injuries. And this is another randomized trial. The randomization, of course, occurred uh, with a better technique than in Lee's article. But what they found is that there was no difference now in their study with the SMFA or SF36. And one can argue that those perhaps are not sensitive enough um, tests to draw out any uh, significant uh, uh, issues related to the foot and ankle. 100% of their open reduction internal fixations had anatomic reductions. Only one ORIF needed a later arthrodesis. And they had a, a much higher secondary surgery rate, though, in their ORIF group. But the vast majority of these secondary surgeries was part of a protocol to remove the internal fixation of those people that had primary ORIFs. Uh, and that uh, I think they had 14 patients and 11 of them had hardware removed and this was counted as a secondary reoperation rate and those people that didn't have surgery, the three people that didn't have their hardware removed, felt well and apparently didn't need to have it out or refused to have their hardware out. So what did I learn from Henning? Well, I learned that maybe open reduction internal fixation really isn't that bad after all. So it's been my turn to speculate now. What's responsible for our failed ORIFs of lis ligamentous lis frank injuries? And I think what we uh, know is that if we don't achieve a reduction, we're going to fail. 
and, and this may be related to the techniques we've used. We use closed reductions historically and percutaneous reductions and maybe poorly executed open reductions, particularly when we left the midfoot joints extended and gapped on the plantar aspect. We didn't achieve stability, and that's because we used inappropriate use of K-wires or short screw fixations or not enough fixation. And I think this is all about leverage as there's a tremendous amount of bending forces that go through the tarsal metatarsal joint, and short screws simply don't have the leverage to maintain the stability to healing. And I think what's going to come up throughout this is that we didn't understand the associated abnormal stresses that impact our fixation constructs, which leads to number three is that maybe we didn't really understand the pathology of what was going on and that the injury, maybe the injury occurs through a quote sick joint complex. Could these people have pre-existing hypermobility and if so, what would that be due to? Well, it could be because they have pre-existing long-standing gastrocnemius equinus contractor. Otherwise, as Steve Bernerschke has taught us, it's the root of all evil. And I think that it was stated yesterday that if you find someone with a foot or ankle injury that does not have gastroc equinus contracture, that that's a reportable, a reportable thing. <laughs> and that if unaddressed, this gastroc equinus contracture, if unaddressed, it may lead to forced concentration at the injured or reduced and stabilized tarsal metatarsal joints, and it's a setup for failure because of an abnormal stress concentration, which is maybe why they got the condition in the first place. So because of these failures, we decided that fusion is the best option, and is this bad? No, it's not bad, but I suggest that maybe we don't need to. Maybe we just need to rethink how we do our operative fixation without fusion. One of the problems maybe with a primary tarsal metatarsal arthrodesis is best summed up by this analogy that Dr. Hansen said to me one day, and that a good ORF is technically challenging and a good midfute fusion is technically challenging, and are we sure that we can achieve a good fusion in the setting of an acute injury? And this is analogous to the smash calcaneus. That fixing a common nude calcaneus is hard, doing a good subtalar fusion is hard, and why the hell would you want to do both at the same time? <laughs> and if the surgical tactic still never addresses the soft tissue pathology, then it'll still be prone to those abnormal forces and still a potential loss of fixation. So here's the purely ligamentous Lis Frank injury. My preferred treatment is the gastroc equinus release, followed by open reduction internal fixation to achieve anatomic reduction of the tarsal metatarsal joints and stable fixation of the medial column with flexible fixation of the lateral column. Long screw fixations of first, second, and third TMTs using 4.0 millimeter cortical screws which have improved bending stiffness uh, with two screws used for those that uh, medial column as we've seen earlier. Afterwards, slight dorsiflexion splinting for a couple of weeks and then daily gastrosoleus stretching with resting and night splinting and weight bearing is delayed for 10 to 12 weeks and custom orthotics at six to nine months. And then you have to ask them when they want the other one released because they're gonna love how well their injured side now feels. So in summary, I would say that maybe we need to rethink our open reduction internal fixation algorithm for this particular injury. And I think we're having a better understanding of the pathology. I think that Cliff study has demonstrated we have very successful results with open reduction internal fixation in this particular group comparable to primary uh, fusions with the option for potentially restoring normal anatomy to the tarsal metatarsal joints, but it requires adequate stability. Anatomic reductions, long screw fixations of the rigid medial column, and release of the gastroc equinus contracture when it's <coughs> present. Thanks very much. Thanks uh, everyone at Harborview for um, great experiences and uh, continued experiences uh, that we continue to have here. Um, Dave gave a great uh, discussion concerning ORIF. It also shows somewhat of the variation of uh, how people fix these with either the percutaneous or so forth uh, fixation. I find that to be uh, problematic when you do look at these studies which are quite limited. And the literature has long-standing uh, instability and disability from these injuries requiring further surgery such as arthrodesis down the road. This is not always true and uh, that, that what uh, Dave showed earlier here concerning our results of uh, well done primary uh, fixation with the screws. The mechanism of course is uh, loss of the arch. We have displacement of the tarsal metatarsal joints and it goes under the heading of instability with the inability of the foot to support weight during physiological weight bearing. Yes, of course, you have the columns to the foot where you have the uh, medial column and the uh, lateral column uh, from the foot where you have from there the essential and non-essential joints. In other words, you have a rigid component of the foot and a mobile component of the foot. And again, when you look back at some of the literature on this, 
uh, with arthrodesis that if this is done poorly or arthrodesis of the essential joints, you will have a bad result. Surgical technique, I think, is extremely important from this in terms of, as uh, Dave stated, long screws and rigid fixation of the uh, medial column. With the arthrodesis being similar to that, where you have trephination of the remaining uh, components of the subchondral bone, and then fusion in the same way with cross screws of 3.5 millimeter screws at the first, retrograde at the third and fourth, and then K-wire fixation at the uh, fourth and fifth. Post-operative care, again, to be very important and non-weight bearing for three months, not weight bearing at the um, earlier six week period of time where the K-wires are removed in the office. Our uh, foot and ankle partners like to take out their hardware. As I stated before, some of the problems of this at the initially two months, three months, now four months, uh, the trauma trained fellowship uh, surgeons will keep the hardware in at our institution. And then of course the uh, arthrodesis group has their hardware retained from that. And this is an evaluation of that study that uh, Dr. Henning evaluated from us, who was a foot and ankle fellow here uh, last year. So when you take a look at this, the fixation, alignment, and reduction was very good in both groups. Secondary surgery, as you saw, was higher because of the protocol component of screw removal uh, from that. When you take a look at the results from this, as you stated, from there was the trend and so forth, these are the results of the dysfunction index of the ORF group was worse than the primary arthrodesis, and also with the bother index, and this is most likely due to the small numbers of patients that we had from this, but this is at the two-year mark where this, uh, as they state, uh, long-term follow-up can humble you. Also, we took a look at a phone survey from this and that the most, both groups are quite satisfied with the results. Again, rigid fixation, anatomic alignment for these injuries. So we wanted to take a look then at all our groups of patients that we had over a seven year period of time that had primary arthrodesis but weren't part of this group. So from about 200 patients, we had about half of them returned long-term SMFA evaluation forms. They're about equal in terms of males and females. Uh, again, a young group of patients, 20% or so still had pain at about the two year mark. Uh, most of them were quite satisfied with the results and the appearance of their foot. Mechanism of injuries for these, again, were high energy, where polytrauma can be a problem in terms of interpretation of these outcome results. There are many other associated injuries for these uh, types of injury patterns, both the number of TMT joints involved and other associated injuries such as cuboid, cuneiform in about 40%, uh, and navicular injuries, which can skew the results. About two-thirds in this retrospective evaluation had ORIF, and a third had primary arthrodesis. Hardware was removed in about 50% of the uh, patients in the ORIF group. Secondary surgery were 11 patients, mainly with arthrodesis of the uh, failed ORIF group. This is again, long-term follow-up of those uh, initial groups of patients. We were successful getting people back to work in about 91% of the time. Polytrauma had an outcome effect in terms of the other patients trying to return to work. And this varied from sedentary to heavy duty type jobs. Now when taking a look at the numbers from this in comparison to the normative, that these patients do worse in terms of mobility with these injuries. Males did much worse than females. And that of course polytrauma patients did worse than isolated or the normative groups of patients when you take a look at this even further. But when you take a look at the numbers with the larger group of patients, there was a difference in the fact that the ORIF group and long-term follow-up of over two years did worse than the primary arthrodesis group despite having long screws, anatomic reductions in 97% and uh, rigid fixation. The other component that we saw from this is that uh, patients did better with hardware removed if they had bother or irritation from the screws. So I think the, some of the newer screw designs which have smaller heads with larger uh, shanks are more important to, in terms of stability for these injuries. Also we took a look at the functional outcome predictors of this. So pain and polydrama were predictors of dysfunction and bother, but pain, polytrauma, male gender, and ORIF independently were predictive of mobility problems. So in discussing this in terms of the ability to support weight during physiological loading as being a parameter for this, you take a look at this foot here with the dislocation. They did extremely well with an arthrodesis. 
In our opinion, this is similar to dislocations of the spine in which just placing screws in position don't seem to do as well as in terms of uh, outcomes compared to arthrodesis or posterior lateral fusions for these types of injuries. So taking a look at our large group of patients with a long-term follow-up, I agree with Dave wholeheartedly in the fact that if performed well, optively treated Liz Frank injuries function well in the long term, but are less than the normative in terms of the same age group. ORIF and males long term tend to have worse mobility, but do the same in other types of categories. If you have problems with screw irritation, patients do improve in terms of the bother index compared to retaining the hardware. And pain and polytrauma for these injury patterns seem to be the greatest predictors of dysfunction and bother long term. Thank you. Field questions from the audience? So about 25% of the population, including two foot and ankle surgeons sitting here in this third row, have a tight gastroc. So that means there are about 75 million people with two legs each in the U.S. with tight gastrocs. So if we were to do 150 million preventative gastroc releases, would we stop having Lisfranc injuries? Yes. <laughs> This is a classic example, though, of not taking into account all the parameters. It, in the foot, we see all the time, we see men with massive body weight, but they got a size 16 foot. And then you see a woman who's a third as big, but her, her foot is a quarter as big, I mean, just roughly. And so it's a, you really have to think about body weight <coughs> in, in comparison to the bone size and the foot size. Uh, just body weight itself, we've learned that plenty of times with the operating on women and their foot reconstruction because particularly ankle reconstructions. If they got a size one bone, you're in trouble before you start for, for the size one ankle. Um, Dave, um, there, there's been um, a, a bit of a change in um, screw lengths and size and diameter and, and some discussion about flexibility. Is there a way to put some science to that? <laughs> Uh, well, I think that uh, as we've gone from the 3.5 millimeter screws to multiple 3.5 millimeter screws, now to multiple 4.0 millimeter screws, what's happened is that we've increased the core diameter uh, from the 3.5s to the 4.0s, which I believe now is approaching 2.9. And so, you know, yes there is, and, and each time you increase a small amount of the uh, radius of uh, the core, you're going to substantially improve the bending stiffness. So I think that that's borne out. I think that uh, I don't see very many, if any, of my 4.0 millimeter screws broken uh, in, uh, and I use them for syndesmosis injuries as well, which is a similar kind of ligamentous type healing. Um, I don't see those, the broken screw rate that I used to, just by changing it that little bit. And we, we use uh, screws that are the uh, cold worked uh, 22, 13, 5, the two seven heads. So they're actually probably similar to the 4.0 screws in terms of the uh, stiffness. Um, <coughs> despite being 3.5 millimeter. Yeah, I have a question about the biomechanics. So if uh, this is more common or only occurs in people with tight gastrocnemius muscles, um, how do you explain the, you know, it's, do it's, it's always a dorsal displacement. So I'm just trying to figure out the biomechanics. Has that been worked out well? And I also wanted to ask uh, Cliff if uh, I didn't see in your, note, in your presentation that you did gastric recession on all your lysphonic injuries. I think it's one of those ones that if, if you, don't, you don't know what you don't know, so if you're not looking for it, I think the more that you look at it, I would agree that it's, uh, it's uh, fairly common in these people. And I'd probably have to say our foot and ankle partners do more of those in combination than us. You want to comment, Steve? Uh, Dave's point is well taken. I think the main thing that we really identified was that looking at the sequential series of, of evaluations of treatment, uh, we never really used uh, more than one point of fixation for the medial column in the first series. And we realized after looking at really in foot reconstruction, laptops procedures also weren't as successful routinely or weren't as reproducibly successful in arthrodesis with a single implant. And recognizing that the plantar architecture is what's disrupted. And when you're putting a retrograde implant in to control the first ray, you can't really close down the plantar surface of the joint. And so that with dorsal uh, load, the plantar aspect of the joint gets essentially stressed. And if you don't have that neutralized, and that's where the 
anti-grade fixation of the medial column has really totally changed our outcome. So the point about when we started doing that, then they didn't fail in terms of the acute problems that we would see with single screw fixation. And then we just realized that in addition to that, when you start examining the other side, these people had medial column instability already on their other foot. Yeah, maybe they were, I call them the walking wounded. I mean, they know they, don't, they don't know they have a problem. Now they have a problem with their one foot. And then when you speak to them about their other foot, they really can identify that, yeah, over time, my foot's starting to go a little flatter. And they, those are the ones that we realize that perhaps we should intervene. You know, as a former non-believer, uh, I remember, vividly remember one, the first list Frank I combined this with, and this fellow had uh, a substantial Aquinas contractor of his other side, and as soon as we released his gastroc on the injured side, you could appreciate that as he pushed on his forefoot, how much more motion came through his ankle joint rather than stressing his newly fixed tarsal metatarsal joint, and at that point it just became obvious how mechanically this was advantageous for your fixation. Time for one more quick question, Sam. Uh, Cliff and, and Dave, you know, the, the outcome following um, foot injuries, particularly in the trauma patients, as has been alluded to, is so multivariant. How do you, how do you account for problems, subtle problems like gait abnormalities um, following, you know, because most of the trauma patients I take care of, they, they tend to externally rotate a little bit as they're, as they're achieving their gait again or subtle differences in, in, in forefoot balance, um, clawing of the toes during the, the dynamic phase of the gait. The ability to walk comfortably is, is so confounding. Um, There's so many variables. And I was just wondering in your, in your, uh, in your outcome studies, how do, you, how do you account for that as being a contributing factor? Well, I think you have to get to a couple things. Uh, one, I guess you could say, if you had a uh, less tight gastroc, you wouldn't have to vault over your foot, uh, number one. Number two is that I think that you need uh, an anatomic reduction of the injury itself so you don't have a varus valgus and you're uh, loading the foot in abnormal positions, uh, number two. Um, but taking a look at these a little bit further, uh, that there are combinations of injuries such as midfoot injuries. You have more than three that we took a look at. You're predictably going to have a worse outcome long term than not. Uh, talus and pilon are absolutely uh, horrendous in terms of uh, getting you to that next level in terms of uh, dysfunction and problems with your uh, outcomes also. But just taking a look at these patients who didn't have those other associated injuries, so those weren't confounding factors that again, the arthrodesis group seemed to do better in mobility um, from this long term at the two-year mark. Uh, but again, I think that the anatomic reduction component uh, and a appropriate therapy is, uh, is uh, beneficial. All right, well, let's thank Dave and Cliff for their wonderful topics. Thank you. Thank you.